All right, this is lecture six, colonial life. All right, we're going to start by looking at the Chesapeake region, or Virginia, or in a whole, the southern colonies. And the main point here is going to be this concept that the colonies were unhealthy, right? It was hot, it was swampy, all that sort of stuff. And so it's going to be a pretty long period of time until we see Virginia uh, become self-sustaining from its birth rate. You can see a couple sort of facts here, right? Uh, these diseases took their toll. People died 10 years earlier in Virginia. Half the people born in Virginia and Maryland died before their 20th birthday, and few lived to see their 50th birthday, um, especially women. Most were single, right? So people that immigrated to Virginia were single, and they were mostly men. Since women were few, they were very scarce, and so when it came to starting a family, uh, men were limited in finding a mate. Most children uh, grew up with only one parent. Um, most marriages, uh, a, a partner in a marriage would die probably within about seven years. Um, and so this created a shaky sort of family life, and this shaky family, these shaky family ties also manifested itself in a lot of young women uh, having children outside of marriage. Um, so originally, or initially, the birth rates in Virginia are going to be low. Uh, it's going to be populated basically through immigration until, you know, the early 17th century. All right, so the one thing that did grow well and the one thing that was very hospitable in uh, the South slash Virginia slash Chesapeake region was tobacco growth. Okay. Um, it had some side effects, right? Clearly the environment worked, but it had some side effects. Um, people were always looking for new land because even it says right here, it sucked up nutrients in the soil. And so commercial growers began to move farther and farther uh, away from where they had started, which put them into closer contacts with Native Americans. By 1630, the Chesapeake shipped 1.5 million pounds of tobacco, and by 1700, nearly 40 million pounds. Uh, as it says right there, overproduction is going to bring the prices down, the whole supply and demand effect. But the main overall idea was, is that people began to immigrate there. They began to buy up more and more land, and we'll see more of that here in a second, um, and they began to produce tobacco. This is an advertisement from that time period, right? But more so, if we look at it from a primary source, what can we see here? Uh, we can see tobacco plants, right? We can see ships, thus being loaded with tobacco to be sent back to Europe. We can see the slaves working there, smoking the tobacco. Um, also, you can see the sun, right, up here shining happily, making this doesn't look like a sort of bad condition, right? Yet again, it's an ad, so this would have been not probably as... Uh, picturesque as it's portrayed. So the big thing was they needed labor, right? They tried to enslave the Indians. That didn't work. <clears throat> Most of them died to disease um, or fighting, right? As it says right here, African slaves were expensive, so they needed more and more indentured servants, as we've seen. So what they're going to have in Maryland and Virginia is referred to as the headright system. What would happen is the landowner would get X amount of acres of land for bringing over another uh, worker or laborer. So if you had some money, you could bring over a ton of laborers to work your land and sort of multiply how large your your holdings were, right? So it was like a double investment, if you will. And so this headright system is going to be what creates these large landowning families in Virginia. And when we think of these large landowning families, we refer to them as the landed gentry, and they begin to dominate uh, politics and society in this, in this colony, right? And we're going to counter this with what we see in New England. So indentured servants were brought over, as it says right here, 100,000 uh, in the region by 1700. Remember, they get freed after working, you know, depending on how long their contract was. And in the end, they get their freedom dues, right? which you can read about in the textbook, but it's like tools and, and maybe some land. What's going to happen, though, is we're going to see is there's going to be a change in uh, viewpoint after Bacon's Rebellion, and uh, they're not going to want to bring in as many indentured servants, and also you're going to see the, number, the amount of land begin to uh, be squeezed, and so bringing over 
people with the head right system is also going to be uh, abolished. This leads us to Bacon's Rebellion. So a lot of these indentured servants, right, had become freed men, but they didn't have anywhere to work, and they were poor and ready to be riled up. Nathaniel Bacon, 29-year-old planter, uh, is going to lead them in a rebellion against the Native Americans, who they saw as, you know, basically what happens is some of these freedmen would move into territories that were inhabited by Native Americans trying to, to eke out an existence, and they would get into fights with them. So Bacon leads a rebellion with this group of freedmen in Virginia against the Native Americans, and they slaughter the Native Americans, and then turn their ire towards Jamestown, and they burn Jamestown. Um, Governor William Berkeley is going to fight back in this rebellion. Eventually, Nathaniel Bacon will die, and Berkeley will crush the rebellion, uh, and he'll hang some of the re rebels. Um, as I pointed out in class, the planter class was not excited about this uh, sort of byproduct of indentured servitude, so what they're going to do is they're now going to shift sort of, spe not specifically, but wholly to slavery instead of indentured servitude. So, colonial slavery. In the late 17th century, right, you can see right here, 7 million people are going to be brought to the New World over 300 years. Now, um, as you'll notice, it says only 400,000 are going to be brought to North America. Most of these slaves uh, are going to be brought to the Caribbean or to Brazil uh, or South America, if you want to say. They have all these places are going to develop different sort of slave cultures, if you will. And North America, the colonies, um, promoted slaves to have families, okay? Um, they saw it as a way to sort of temper the, the mindset of the slave. They'd be more, you know, willing to work, that kind of thing, if they had a wife and family. Um, while in South America, they saw the idea of having kids around as being not as lucrative because the kids couldn't work, but they were mouths to feed. They also made the women slaves out of commission for a while while they were pregnant. So um, what would happen is a lot of times they worked them to death in sugar fields and stuff like that uh, and then just replaced them. Uh, 1619, the first Africans were brought to Jamestown. By 1670, 7% of the southern population was uh, a slave. Colonists could not afford high prices for these slaves, so those large landowners, like we talked about, were the ones, for the most part, that were bringing over slaves. And the you know large landowning family with all the slaves was the you know the the Virginia dream, if you will. You can see that most of these slaves are going to come from West Africa. Okay. Also with the gold with the Gold Coast there. Now eventually we'll talk about triangular trade, how we're gonna go like this, and uh, we'll get to it, but the idea was, right, we're gonna bring stuff from North America to trade for slaves, right? And then the mass, vast majority of those slaves, as I pointed out, end up in the West Indies or Brazil, and then this number, three, about 360,000, are gonna end up in North America. You can see here, and yet again, another primary source. This would have been a diagram, right, of how these slaves are going to be shipped. And, you know, this is yet again treating people like property or chattel, as your textbook will refer to it. Um, there was no room, right? This is going to be a horrible thing. 20% sometimes of uh, groups of slaves are going to die on the middle passage, the, the journey from Africa to the New World. Once they get there, right, 1600 legal difference between African and slaves, white servants was unclear, uh, but that's going to change, right? So eventually we're going to get the slave code. The slave code, right, is basically setting up the idea that uh, black slaves and their children are property, okay? So the offspring of slaves is going to be property to the master as well. Also, um, there are certain things, um, you, it was illegal to teach a slave to read and write. It's going to be illegal to... Um, even preach the gospel in certain places, right? Now, I think over time these codes are going to change. Uh, there's even a story I was reading about how Thomas Jefferson took one of his slaves with him to France so he could learn how to cook, right, and become a better cook for Thomas Jefferson. Um, and I'll get more into that uh, as we get to Thomas Jefferson. So with the addition of slavery, you're going to see the gap in the social structure in the South widen, right? That's the idea. So yet again, as I pointed out numerous times, in the South, you had a much larger gap in wealth. You had rich people 
and you had really poor people, okay? There wasn't a lot of uh, middle class. You have the social structure here in the South. The big thing is this landless, uh, landless white group here is going to be marginalized because they're going to pass laws that basically say that uh, land, uh, landless people can't vote, right? So that's going to be a big thing and really kind of uh, control or solidify the political power for the planter elite. So uh, since most guys are going to live out on their, their plantations, right, especially the well-to-do guys, the growth of big urban cities never happens in the South or doesn't happen initially in the South. And so since that, you're not going to have the urban professional, the lawyer, uh, the financier, the banker, however you want to call it. And so that is going to stunt the growth of the South uh, economically. And then in turn, uh, since life revolved around these plantations and these great plantations were usually on major waterways like rivers, right, roads are going to be terrible in the South as well. Right? Also, when we get to the Civil War and stuff like that, there's not going to be many, as many railroads because, yet again, the principal mode of transport is going to be waterway. So we'll move into New England here, and it's sort of the polar opposite of Virginia. Uh, they tended to live 10 years longer, right, where the other guys lived 10 years less. They're going to average, the first people that move there are going to average for 70 years. They tended not to migrate as single people or single males like we saw in the other one. They tended to go as families, which provided more and more support, okay? And so their population is going to basically boom, and they'll be able to populate New England just from its birth rate alone. As we said, in Virginia, there's a lack of women. Well, in New England, since they moved as families, women got married pretty early, and they tend to produce more babies, right? Uh, labor and childbirth, right, was a, a dread for women, especially because of the idea of the time, right? Doctors weren't as advanced, so the possibility of dying was very, very high. Um, married women uh, could experience up to 10 pregnancies and raise as many as eight children. Longevity contributed to this family stability, as I pointed out, right? Uh, this is going to be the first generation of people that are really going to get to know their grandparents, were in the Virginia colonies, that seldomly happened. Picture from your textbook of one of the, from the time period of a woman, yet again, showing her age, right? So a couple more contrasts, right? The fragility of Southern families advanced the economic security of women in the South. So if men died, they could hold on to their property, right? Um, as it says right there. And then women in New England, however, gave up property rights when they were married. As it says right here, concept of women's rights as individuals began to appear in the 1600s, right? But they still couldn't do much. They did have some sphere of authority, um, and it was usually in women-dominated professions or midwifery, nursing. Uh, I guess nursing hadn't come on yet uh, fully as a, a big thing, but also in, in the domestic sphere uh, around the home. Yet again, New England family laws here, right? Divorce was very rare. If people just didn't get along, they were usually court-ordered to remain together. Um, abandonment, though, and adultery were reasons for divorce, as you guys asked me about before. I said this was not super uncommon, this idea of people leaving people and just going somewhere else. Much like in Virginia, places were planned out, right? But in doing this, right, there's way more equality, right? Each family is going to receive a several parcel of land, woodlot, right? Tracked for growing crops, pasturing animals. Towns of over 50 families were required to make an elementary school, right? Where yet again in Virginia, you had this kind of sucked up by large landowning groups. Congregational churches, right? Congregation, right? The group of people uh, were pretty prevalent in Puritan towns, and they had a very basic form of democracy, right? These congregational church had church councils, or they voted on stuff, and that kind of sowed the seeds for democracies. So it's town meetings, classrooms for democracy. They elected officials, they appointed schoolmasters, they discussed main matters like uh, road repair. Over time, you're not going to have as many hardcore Puritans moving in, and so uh, less or as it says right there, there's a decline in conversion and a decline in people wanting to toe the line with uh, the Puritan way. So what's going to happen is they're going to establish this halfway covenant. And the halfway covenant really is just going to be a way for offering partial membership to the church. It was kind of like saying, hey, we're going to baptize you even if you haven't, um, you know, you haven't felt converted yet. 
And what it was was a hope to um, bring people into the church and grow their numbers. And it says right here by 1600, a new form of doomsaying sermons had appeared, right? Those those doomsaying sermons probably didn't entice people. And so this is why they had to come up with this halfway covenant. In Salem, Massachusetts in 1692, you're going to have the Salem Witch Trials. We'll look at this more in class, but basically uh, you had youths that had become sort of bored and had issues, and they claimed to have been uh, bewitched by, I want to say it was like a, a slave of somebody or a servant or something. I don't remember it. If you'll read The Crucible, you'll get a lot of it. Um, and so the witch hunt ensued and led to a legal lynching of 20 individuals. 19 were hanged and one was pressed to death with rocks. Uh, it says two dogs were also hanged. Um, as it says, witchcraft persecutions were common at this time. You had the whole Spanish Inquisition and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, this is more of a um, statement on the paranoia and the problems of this sort of theoc the theocratical uh, lifestyle that you had in Massachusetts. So where New England, or excuse me, Virginia didn't had great soil, New England didn't. It had rocky soil that they couldn't really farm, right? So this difficult land caused them to live in closer context in the more urban areas and caused them to be eth more ethnically mixed, right? Um, it said black savers on a modest scale because a few stable crops were grown on small farms, uh, but eventually, as we're going to see, that's going to be gotten rid of. Calvinism, soil, and the climate made for energy, purposefulness, sternness, and summerness, and self-reliance and resourcefulness. Uh, and it says right here that they saw them as God's chosen people. Yet again, American exceptionalism. So back in those times, right, uh, as it says, overwhelmingly majority were farmers. Um, the daily tasks were assigned by gender and age. So if you were a man and older, right, you did certain things. If you were a kid and younger, you did other things. Uh, as it says right here, the sun set the schedule, right? People used to go to sleep when the sun went down. So, you know, in the fall or winter time, right, that's pretty early. And so people went to bed pretty early. They didn't have lights, right, and it was expensive. It was cost a lot of resources to burn fire to, for light all the time. Uh, life was humble but comfortable compared to Europe because land was cheap. Uh, the Most of the people that immigrated from Europe, right, were kind of middling of the sort. They weren't rich or poor, really. Uh, frontier life didn't allow for people to become sort of ostentatious about their wealth. And then efforts to reproduce a finely stratified society as Europe proved feeble in early America where equality and democracy found fertile soil at least for white people. You'll also read about in your textbook um, a rebellion in New, New York against people trying to uh, sort of pass laws that are going to stratify, stratify society like Europe. Uh, it's going to be led by this middle class group of merchants that want to ensure some, some level sort of, of equality in those places. <laughs> 